Welcome back everyone, this is theCUBE's wrap up of our third day and final day here at the Open Source Summit. I'm John Furrier, Rob Streche, my co-host all week. Rob, breaking down all the action, great guests. We're here in beautiful um, Vancouver. If you check out our scene here, we got a great view. We've been, it's been like a great office. No, no problem with the lighting. The guys did great, team was awesome. But we're looking out this great window for the water. It's been phenomenal. Guys, great job with the lighting. Uh, just a beautiful venue, but it's an intimate event. This is the premier open source event where the industry decides kind of what's going to look like for the next few years, a trajectory, the die gets cast, plans roll into motion. It's not the big monster event with 10, 20, 30,000 people. It's a handful, a few thousand people, the top people here, bring in cloud and open source and turning that into applic an application-centric society. Um, powering, open free software, open source is one. These are the things we talk about. And our big story this week, Rob, has been the questions we were going to ask was, yeah. is AI going to be the tornado that's going to topple over generations of open source uh, work and value, or will it survive? How will open source respond to that wave? Security, will their work and security go the next level? Are they on the right track? And three, how are they going to structure the projects and handle this next generation of developers? on the back of cloud native, knowing that the CNCF is exploding in, in size. Right. And the Linux Foundation, as a result, is growing. So rising tide is floating all the boats. These were the questions. What's your, what's your reaction, what's your take on, on what, we, what we saw this week? I, I think it was a great week of advancement in many different areas. Uh, a lot of discussions about new people coming in um, new consumers coming in and new contributors coming in. And I think to your point about AI, I think it was that they are thinking about it and that they're, they're not sitting on the sidelines uh, to the point of some of the keynotes being about how they're embracing other foundations that are bringing more AI to the, to the table. And I think that there is still, uh, I think, ways that they're looking to address it from a, as we talked about back in, at KubeCon, you yeah. know, the, the kind of the uh, code pollution aspect of it. Yeah. And I think that still it's early days, but I think that definitely things like SBOM, uh, how they go beyond uh, platform engineering, how they make it easier, yeah. is definitely on the radar, which is, was great mm -hmm. to see. Yeah, I think the security angle, I want to dig into that in a second. Yeah. My big takeaway to your, to your point about this, how projects are managed and the, this new generation is, the platform engineering concept came up a lot. Obviously AI, we talked about AI already. They're ready for it. Yeah. I think people are pragmatically and, and optimistic about it. They understand it. They understand automation, understand the value. Human plus AI is better than AI by itself. Uh, we used the chess example with Matt Butcher from Fermion. That seems to be the consensus around the board. Okay, all the experts are pointing to that. AI plus, a, human plus AI is better than AI all the time. The other thing that I, I want to report is that these LLMs yeah. are uh, a potential energy problem. Yeah. Uh, and new content on theCUBE this, this week was energy. Right. Sustainability around how open source software is powering grids and the energy piece of it, a huge important part of it. So that was a big aha, and I think that that's, we're going to look at that, that's new information, I'm going to report on that. But AI, they're ready. Platform engineering is, is back. And that this ecosystems are developing, and that could be a good thing, but it's a double-edged sword. If ecosystems become siloed and a moat, a moats can also be protection-oriented, very yeah. proprietary. So there has to be awareness to that ecosystems decoupled from each other can be cohesive, but they got to interact. You got to have some threaded coupling, if you will, or thread the needle between these systems. Yeah, I, I, I think that was, and we had a number of uh, really great guests on where we talked about the fact that there is some overlap in some of these projects. And so you have competing projects. They're not only competing from a technology perspective, but they may be competing for the same people to actually help in those communities. Because there's only so many people to go around uh, to contribute, and I think yeah. that, that is really interesting about the ecosystems, and I think ultimately ecosystems are goodness, but, and they drive further development, further involvement, uh, 
but is one going to win over the other? That yeah. becomes the question mark. Yeah, I, I, think, I think developers should look at the ecosystem says, you go to college, which club do I want to join, or which frat or sorority do I want to join? But you got to be careful not to get locked into the ecosystem. Right. I think one of the things that I've seen is great ecosystems work when that cohesiveness is there and that community's there, but you got to have the ability to traverse across yep. other groups yep. and have access because there are APIs, modern apps have APIs and microservices, stateless seems to be the way, and you got to have that systems approach. Right, yeah, and I think we had some really interesting when we had uh, you know, some, several people on talking about how it's not just about the infrastructure, it's getting that next level up. So where KubeCon was very infrastructure heavy, today, you know, this, this week was you know, a lot more around how do you have uh, you know, authorization, how do you have the different security features plugged in, how do you make sure that you're, you're not just doing a checkbox for an SBOM, uh, from a security perspective, and I think there's been a lot more thought put into it and put forward that is really bringing some neat stuff out that's going to be extremely, uh, I guess, beneficial. I, I thought also what was very interesting was, uh, you know, talking about the fact that it's not just about the cloud and some of its edge, and some of its disconnected devices, and where, how, th how these services will run when they're offline, or air-gapped, for that matter, which was very interesting. Yeah, a lot of great stuff. Um, SiliconAngle.com has all the stories from theCUBE. If you're new to theCUBE, we do this openly out in, the, out in the world at events, we extract the signal from the noise. The journalists at SiliconANGLE write the stories that they see and listen to, and that's published on SiliconANGLE.com. Now we have our AI tool, you'll start to see automatic clips come out, and maybe some stories. I did a little test today on LinkedIn, where I put an automated summary, actually credited it to be AI, I'm being transparent. It actually did a good job, <laughs> and see how the results are. But here's the stories we've got on SiliconANGLE right now from this event, Rob. I want to run them by you. It's a good rundown to what uh, our journalists felt were good stories. Uh, we talked about the, the energy, we had the cloud native apps powering consumption needs using Kepler metrics. We just talked about that. We love how cloud native can bring the agility to the industrial IoT and do things like policy-based managing of power, no one to run the wash machine, no one to run the factory floor, tying workloads that have power demands and do that in policy. Just love that, just a great use of you know, policy-based execution. Um, the, the another one story that I want to bring up is the new organization, Open SSF, Open Software um, Security Foundation. Amazon put some money, I think Google did too. The S-bombs have got to be more dynamic and reduce the software, so that's one of the headline stories. You right. brought this up. The security movement, and Lauren brought this up uh, earlier, um, the security advancements have been very strong with, within the open source. Not a good track record <laughs> in open source, with respect to security, other than they've been good at it, but not great. Yeah, I, and I think that everybody realizes that, I think, and it, it, I guess it's one of those, you have to admit you have a problem before you can actually solve for it, and I think that Log4j or, you know, really was an eye-opening moment for this community, and I think it's an eye-opening moment, and I think it also brings the, the specter of potential regulation, and if you don't police yourself, somebody else is going to do it for you. So I think that's been great uh, getting in there. But I think also the acknowledgement that S-bombs are not enough. And that as soon as one is created, it's now out yeah. of date. And how are you going to deal with that as Got to well? be more dynamic. And by the way, they tie to the observability data. Right. Marrying that was a big point. That came up from uh, Red Hat. We had a great conversation. Uh, from proprietary to open source, the new landscape, the Red Hat uh, engineer, he was awesome, came and gave a great talk. Yeah. And then my fa one of my favorite stories was with uh, um, uh, Fidelity and Discover. We had two large you know, blue chip enterprises. I mean, what a gift, Rob, yeah. to have that kind of quality on theCUBE, sharing openly some of the challenges. Fidelity talked about their 4,000 app teams, how platform engineering, how they view it. It's a lot like IT, the centralized organization. And then we had the FinOps um, side of it for Discover. Okay, Angel Diaz, former IBM, talking about how they, their journey is, how they handle working backwards from the customer and being focused on that space. And then he had some great advice on if you're using things multiple times, then make it a feature, don't design right. the platform first. 
right. do the use cases, then figure out where the re, re, where you're doing it multiple times, and then bring it into the platform. That was the end user stories were pretty compelling. What's your I, what's your take on that? I thought they were great. I, I thought they were fantastic because I think it's again. Uh, especially with Angel and with Fidelity, and there's multiple other Fidelity people that we've been able to talk to off the record throughout the week, and I think it's been great to see that they're all getting involved and they're bringing a open source mentality back to their companies and contributing back with Fidelity uh, doing their plug-in for Jenkins uh, to help with uh, CD events, and I think part of that was Again, they're not just talking about it or consuming it, they're actually contributing back. I thought what was neat about um, when we were talking with Discover and Angel, it was really about the fact that they're even open sourcing to a certain extent their Discover Technology Academy and the content there to actually upskill people. And I think that was really neat as well. And a, uh, I think that type of giving back is super important. Yeah, and I, and I just noticed a typo on the article here. They had Journey and FinOps, which it should be um, FinOS. Fin FinOS. FinOS, yes. <laughs> yeah. I made that same mistake, by the way, when I yeah. introduced them. So <laughs> FinOps, we've been doing a lot of FinOps coverage on SiliconANGLE. And again, important to, to, while we're here, to call out that distinction. FinOps is cost optimization, FinOp, financial operations. FinOps is finan FinTech open, Foundation, that's part yes. of the different open source uh, FinTech. Completely different things. Yes, yeah, and I, I think what's really neat about FinOS is that it starts with the consumers, with the people who are uh, the actual customers, the people in the financial community. Uh, I think, you know, again, Fidelity being here and that they actually signed up uh, and became a member of FinOS uh, this week, but you have all of the big, you know, big financial services corporations in, uh, you know, over in Europe, at the UK, in the States now, many of them are there and they're driving the agenda. So it's actually kind of working in reverse of how many of the other open source communities work. It's very verticalized, which was really neat. And it kind of begs the uh, question of what other ones will come up in the future, will there be a healthcare one revisited? Uh, there, you know, after there was a research group around that uh, back in 2020 when the pandemic was happening. Uh, so this will be, I think, really interesting to see that the success of FinOS and how it's joined the Linux Foundation and brought that verticalization to it. Yeah, and I like their attitude of how they're handling their across their organization, because it wasn't, he, his, his answer on platform engineering was very interesting. Yeah. It wasn't as uh, hardcore as Fidelity's. It was a little bit more horizontal, scalable. I think Fidelity had much more rigid ops yeah. thing to it. Um, big part of the story, and again, continuing to do it. Also, we had um, data conversations, a lot of oh, yeah. data conversations coming in the cube. We had um, two great talks. Lauren came out to talk about our book. I thought that was phenomenal today. And we had um, a great conversation with Matt Butcher from um, Ferion. He he really went in, went out on a limb and said, yeah. talked about the role of open source. That was that was great as well. Um, yeah, just yeah. great stuff. Yeah, and we had Manfred on from uh, Trino slash uh, Starburst as well, and talked about the data federation and how you can you know the differences between Trino and uh, Presto and where things could be used. And I think. That's the neat thing is you're seeing that it's at the application layer here and into the data layer versus just at the all, of, I mean, it is still plumbing and infrastructure, but it's at a different uh, place in the stack. And I think many stacks here this week. All right, so Rob, to wrap things up, I want to just go back to our, our first day <laughs> and looking at the write-ups that our journalists kind of picked up on our riffing. It's always good to see what they <laughs> interpret us saying. So the two major take things that we points we made on day one was the future of open source in the age of AI. We're going to break down the insights, and we said that we were going to explore the intersection of AI, platform engineering, and the open source ecosystems. I think we did a good job. I think so. I think, well, we, I think we nailed we that. it. <laughs> we got a lot of AI. Yeah. We asked every guest what they thought. We, we explored the platform engineering nuance between apps 
and app teams, mm -hmm. in this case thousands on fidelity to what a platform engineering is and how that's changing as more of an IT infrastructure code and then of course the ecosystems. Yeah. All changing. Yes, and, and like you said, the ecosystems and the, the fact that are they going to become moats or not and how do those communities really evolve and we even got into some of the community aspects of it yesterday with, uh, with Janu, so it was really a lot of fun. And we had also uh, Ed Warnicke from Cisco, yep. uh, always a big brain in the queue, yeah. he's doing Omnibore, very getting into SBOMs. He's got this awesome, I won't say graph database, but a graph concept of how to yeah. prioritize working with SBOMs to get that dynamic nature. Again, he's always ahead of the curve. He's the one who called to the attention this chess analogy where you have human augmentation actually is better than AI by itself, and he used the example of chess, you know, AI against AI or human against AI. And if you human plus AI actually makes that a better result combo. Right. And so hats off to Ed over at Cisco. And of course our tornado analogy got mixed up many times, but we, we tried to do a good job there. But overall, I thought a great event and uh, you know, great venue. You know, yeah. We had a great seat here all week and some great guests. What was your biggest takeaway, Rob, before we wrap up? I, I think it is that, again, and you know, we kind of talked about it, like you said, but that the platform engineering and AI are going to continue to evolve, and there's a lot of effort being put into that, and I think I was extremely excited about the amount of security and the, the actual work being done on security, because I think that is a huge piece going forward uh, as we move forward, now that open source has won, yeah. we definitely need to be secure. My final takeaway was I learned a lot, and one thing that validated my position on Superstack was there's going to be a supercompute hardware layer. We heard about hardware with right. some of the energy stuff. Software's everything now. Even hardware is software. You talk to NVIDIA, they're a software company. Hardware companies say they're a software company. Software and hardware are going to be one. Obviously, that's the software open source. We're seeing traction there. And then moving up the stack, everyone's going to try to have a control plane. You're going to start to see this platform wars going on. I think yeah. you're going to see um, everyone trying to be the platform. I got an open source project, I'm going to have a cloud, I'm going to have a control plane. You know, the, the playbook, you can only have so many platforms, and I think apps will be more platform-like and platform connected, so I think tools will become quasi-platforms yeah. and have connective tissue glue between them, but you can't have dozens and dozens of platforms, you got to have a handful of platforms in a company, so yeah. I just see a train wreck potentially there. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that that one, that and the overlap in projects and platforms is still, I think, one of the hardest things to navigate at one of these conferences in understanding the nuances between the projects when sometimes they do have a significant amount of overlap. And final, final point is, as software continues to rule the world, there's going to be a step function increase in velocity, volume, and capabilities, and what that's going to increase is complexity and taming complexity. You know, as the cloud and open source gets more complex, companies will need to manage that, and I think you'll see innovation around abstracting away complexities, and also bolt-on, you know, the classic innovation strategy, bolt something on or build an abstraction layer. So I think we're going to see a lot of innovation around security and data coming quickly. Uh, obviously AI will force that. And I think I've learned that if you're not AI ready, meaning having the data, having the data infrastructure or the software, you're going to get blown over. And I think the tornado will, will, will wreck you if you not have that data ready philosophy. I agree, I agree. Okay, that's a wrap on day three. Guys, I want to say thanks to the team. Guys, Brendan, Christian, Andrew, way <laughs> to go. Anderson, great job, the team here. Of course, the Linux Foundation, thank you for having us. Appreciate your hospitality, bringing theCUBE as usually. Great result. We have so much data hitting the internet. We got generative AI clips being developed by our, by our AI. The, the cubeai.com, check it out. We're on a wait list now, we're letting people in. And of course, go to thecube.net. Check out siliconangle.com, the story's hitting. Tsunami of content hitting from this event. Thanks for watching. For Rob Stretchy, I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. We'll see you soon. <laughs>